A quorum being present, the annual town meeting will come to order. We'll omit reading the return of the warrant, which shows that it was properly served. I ask that all who can rise. of St. John's Episcopal Church will give the invocation, and I ask that you remain standing after the invocation to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear God, we give you thanks for all the blessings of our lives. As we begin this town meeting, we invite your presence. Send your spirit of wisdom, clarity, and justice that with steadfast purpose we may promote the well-being of all your people. Keep us mindful of our neighbors, guide our deliberations, and finally keep us safe until we meet again. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, George. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming tonight. The annual report records the passing of 16 former town employees and officials in 2018. I submit the following memorial resolution. Whereas the citizens of Manchester by the Sea note with profound regret the deaths of several of their friends and neighbors during the past year, and seek to recognize and acknowledge their varied contributions to the town's commonwealth and welfare and our mutual sense of community. We citizens hereby salute the departed, acknowledge our common indebtedness to them, extend the sympathy of the town to their intimates and survivors, and declare that this resolution be entered in the town archives and a true copy be sent to the appropriate survivors. The persons memorialized and their achievements are proclaimed in the order of the dates of their deaths. Sergeant William Leskowski, Police Department. Samuel Adams, Town Moderator, School Committee, Fence Viewer. John Graves, Electronic Infrastructure Committee, Sewer Task Force. Carol T. Shanley, Council on Aging Volunteer, and 2008 Volunteer of the Year. Cornelia Nina Adams, Community Preservation Committee and Pound Keeper. F. Geraldine Costello, School Teacher. David Kale, Conservation Commission and Community Preservation Committee. George Brown, Town Council. Adele Q. Irvin, Finance Committee, Library Board of Trustees, Friends of the Council on Aging, Library Building Committee, Poll Worker, 2007 Volunteer of the Year. Richard Archie Southgate, Town Moderator, Chair, Board of Selectmen, Chair, Planning Board. John Gilmore, Chair, Board of Selectmen, Finance Committee, and Water and Sewer Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. Albert M. Creighton, Jr., Conservation Commission, Finance Committee, Christos G. Nahadis, Fire Station Committee and Personnel Board, John Jack Shea, Board of Selectmen, Nancy Bachman, School Employee, Dorothy Gibbon, Treasurer Collector's Office, Sonia Nichols, Library Volunteer. Susan Beckman, the Chair of the Board of Selectmen, moves the resolution as read, and Eli Bowling seconds the motion. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And the memorial resolution is unanimously adopted. I ask that all who can rise and observe a moment of silence in memory of these former town citizens. And now we'll conduct elections to the town's ancient and honorary offices. First, I ask for nominations for Pound Keeper. Mr. Driscoll. Mary Faye Noonan. Mary Faye Noonan. All in favor of Mary Faye Noonan, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 
and she's unanimously elected. We'll now take nominations for five fence viewers. Nicholas White. Nicholas White. Delhi Beloy. I'm sorry, could you th say that again? Delhi Beloy. Delhi Beloy. Yes. Thank you. That helps my spelling. Yes, ma'am. Michael Kulik. Kulik. Thank you. <laughs> I thought that was it, Michelle. <laughs> One more, two more. Gretchen Wood. Gretchen Wood. Andy Harris. Andy Harris. And I declare the nominations closed. If you're in favor of Nick White, Debbie Beloy, Michael Kulik, Gretchen Wood, and Andy Harris for fence viewer, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And they're unanimously elected. Now three field drivers. William Canty. William Canty. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. The first name was? Guyton. I seem to be having trouble hearing tonight. Bruce Heisey. And I declare the nomination is closed. If you're in favor of those three individuals for a field driver, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And they're elected. Three measurers of lumber. Carly A. Cook. Carly A. Cook. Michael Chapman. Michael Chapman. Gary Gilbert. Gary Gilbert. And I declare the nominations closed. If you're in favor of those three individuals for measurers of lumber, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And they are elected. And last but not least, nominations for three measurers of wood and bark. Susan W. Thorne. Susan W. Thorne. <laughs> Gar Morse. Gar Morse. That sounded like retribution. <laughs> One. Michael Chapman. I guess it's okay for him to have two offices. And I declare the nominations closed. If you're in favor of Sue Thorne, Gar Morse, and Michael Chapman for measurers of wooden bark, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. And they're unanimously elected. And that concludes the election of our traditional officers. Excuse me while I have some water. I'll briefly state our customary traditional uh, procedural points. If you want to speak, please wait to be recognized, wait for a mic, and give the meeting your name and address if we don't already have them. I'm Alan Wilson. I ask that you stand when you speak if you can, and this applies to town officials at the front as well as to those on the floor of the meeting. Speakers should remember to direct their remarks to me as moderator and not to other town officials or voters. And speakers must limit their remarks to two minutes or less unless they've received my permission in advance to speak longer. The seats on the floor of the gym are reserved for voters. If you're not a voter and not one of the people who've received my permission to be here in order to speak, you should be seated in the bleachers. And if you are a voter and are sitting in the bleachers, you should move to a seat on the floor because I won't call on those in the bleachers. My intention is to recognize every voter who desires to speak on an issue before the meeting. But if the motion for the previous question, the motion to cut off debate, is properly introduced and seconded, under the rules we follow, it's not debatable. I'll call directly for a vote without further discussion. I'll accept the motion for the previous question only when a voter rises and is recognized solely for that purpose. I won't accept this motion from one who makes a statement on the merits and then immediately moves to, cl to close the door on contrary views. You should have picked up a green card as you checked in. This identifies you as a voter. If we have a counted hand vote, please hold up your card to make sure that you're counted. Non-voters are permitted to attend the meeting with the consent of the moderator. We have with us tonight Gregory Federspiel, town administrator, 
the heads of all depart town departments who are available to answer questions, Pamela Bodwin, Superintendent of the Manchester Essex Regional School District, Avi Urbis, Business Manager of the Regional School District, and Michelle Randazzo, Town Council with KP Law. All these people have my permission to be here and to speak if that becomes appropriate. We also have with us, I think, several Boy Scouts from Troop 3 who are earning their citizenship and community badge, and they're welcome. Once we've established a quorum, as we now have, I'll assume a quorum continues to be present until it's challenged and found lacking by the teller's count. The procedures we follow reflect provisions of the Massachusetts Acts and General Laws, Article 2 of the town's general bylaw, a book called Town Meeting Time, and the traditions of the town. During the evening, you'll hear references to Proposition 2 and a half, which is the nickname of the state law that limits the increase in the tax levy to 2.5% from one year to the next. Town meeting cannot override or exempt from Proposition 2 and a half. That must be done at a town election called by the selectmen. It's unlawful to smoke in the school or elsewhere on school grounds. I ask that you turn off or mute cell phones and other electronic devices. The meeting is being videotaped by 1623 Studios and is also being recorded. I want to thank the following residents who are serving as volunteers tonight. The registrars are voters, Eileen Buckley, Gary Justo, and Bruce Warren. Assisting the registrars in checking in voters and visitors, Adele Ardolino, Martha Gubbins, Carolyn Kelly, Kathy Ryan, Lee Simmons, Pamela Thorne, and Allison Anhold White. The tellers are Nancy Hammond, Beth Heisey, Carolyn Kelly, Kathy Ryan, and Pamela Thorne. Attending the handout table in the lobby, Gary Justo, and attending the electronic voting help desk, Bayon Pike. Also assisting the town clerk and me, high school students Tyler Erdman and Max Warnock. Thank you all for serving the town. I now recognize Susan Beckman, the chair of the Board of Selectmen, for preliminary remarks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So Manchester is a special place. The town continues a very strong financial position. Credit agencies rank Manchester in the highest state for the strength of its finances, and we are well positioned for growth with the ability to borrow if needed and to weather tough times um, with the ability to um, to, with the resources that we have and the ability to meet our obligations. And last month, Manchester was voted as one of the top 12 communities in the state to live in. So Manchester is a special place, but we need to do more than just maintain our current position. Town government's purpose is to serve our citizens, but town government is also only as good as what our citizens make it. We face important issues like infrastructure challenges that call for sound planning, operational issues that require management oversight with accountability. If residents want to maintain low tax rates, then more needs to be done to manage the cost of even the basic services, as well as identifying opportunities for revenue. These must be addressed rigorously to maximize efficiency and with the financial, dis uh, financial discipline of what we spend how we spend it, and how we position ourselves for the next 10 to 15 years. That's why planning is important. We need to look at each initiative with the context of the town's overall priorities defined by our community and our master plan. Safety and security are top priorities this year. That's why Manchester is among the highest per capita spending in the state for public safety. Now with a focus on transitioning police and fire leadership, we expect to have continued the departments to look at how they relate to quality, cost, and the reliability of town service. As part of this strategy, we're following the town's vote last year and looking into regionalization. Work is underway with Essex to look at shared services, and currently there are ideas being looked at, and proposals will be brought to residents in the months coming, but before any changes are enacted. 
Committee boards in, in are critical to the, to the direction and function of town government and to the health of our future. But we continue to struggle to find people to step up. If there are gaps in town government, leadership, and committees, then the town is compromised from the beginning. This needs to change if Manchester is going to remain strong. As citizens, we are vested with rights, privileges, and duties in being part of the community. With the right to express ourselves, we have the responsibility to keep informed and, be participate, and participate. With the right to vote, we have the responsibility to respect the democratic process as well as everyone's rights, beliefs, and opinions. And finally, with the right to disagree, we have the responsibility to do it respectfully. This is what citizenship is, and this year we lost our role model, Adele Irvin. If anyone ever exemplified the spirit, grace, and contribution of true citizenship, it was Adele. Her dedication, perseverance to be informed, asking the hard questions, and holding us accountable for a better Manchester will not likely be seen again. Although, being somewhat of a person as an internal optimist, I hope so. In honor of Adele, we're renaming the Board of Selectmen Citizenship Award to the Adele Irvin Citizenship Award. This annual award. <laughs> this annual award will be presented to the Manchester graduating senior who most represents the quality of good citizenship and will be a reminder to us all of their tremendous contributions to the town. On a personal note, I want to say how much of an honor it's been to serve here in Manchester, both on the Board of Selectmen and the school committee. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for that opportunity. I implore each of you to consider to be more engaged in the town in any way that you can, because this is truly a special place. And for one who knows, it's worth it. Thank you. And I recognize, thank you, Susan, excuse me. I recognize Maury Creighton, the chair of the Finance Committee, for comments on the town's finances. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this meeting. Um, this booklet is an important resource, and hopefully you will keep it for future reference. Let me open by saying that the town of Manchester is in good financial shape. Last year's budget, fiscal year 2018, performed better than expected, and this year's budget, 2019, which ends on June 30th, is looking to be a strong year as well. Estimated revenue and receipts are on budget. Town employees are doing a great job of controlling costs. Capital investments are being made on our aging infrastructure, facilities, and to address the long-term capital needs of the town, um, and a successful effort to reduce our long-term debt. The town's other post-employment benefits, called OPEB, are well being funded and to be fully paid in about 15 years. And finally, the town maintains a AAA bond rating, which is reserved for towns and municipalities that are well managed and financially sound. The Finance Committee works with several guidelines that shape the development of proposed budget and our future recommendations, and these include staying, in within, the, staying within the limits of Proposition 2.5 maintaining reserves equal to 10 to 12 percent of our total expenditures, keeping debt payments to a maximum of 10 percent of our total expenditures, holding the course to fully fund our retiree liabilities, and finally capping non-school exclusions at their current level. This meeting will be asking you to consider and approve budgets which total in spending of approximately $37.8 million. These budgets have been reviewed by the Finance Committee over the course of many meetings with town staff members, the school district, and outside consultants. It's all about making choices. Town's operating budget is consistent with prior years and incorporates small changes for additional staffing in the Selectman's Office for communication and staffing hours for the Conservation Commission and the Harbor Master's Office, as well as a slight increase in non-salaried expenses. With this budget, we anticipate finishing fiscal year 2020 with a fund balance of approximately $5.3 million. This fund represents 14% of our proposed operating budget and is actually above our recommended target of 10 to 12% of reserves and stabilization. 
We're looking at a variety of future budgeting and operating strategies to meet town needs and to stay within the fund balance targets within our coming years. Members of the Finance Committee and town leaders are focusing on long-term analysis, benchmarking, and planning for the town's financial future. We are looking forward 10, 15, and even 25 years out to address the town's capital needs and wants. Different funding options, tighter budgeting, and the use of reserves can reduce our dependence on debt. In this budget, the town's debt service is decreasing by 21.5%, with a savings of almost $340,000 as we use cash to fund specific capital projects. This transition may take another three or four years to fully implement, but will be sustainable and better for the town in the future if we can keep at it. Working closely with the school district and the town of Essex, a majority of the funding for the new Memorial School building project was secured with 30-year bonds at a favorable rate of 3.29% which is significantly better than the models that we presented before you at the town meeting this last fall. For long-term planning and sustainability, our finance committee has ongoing concerns about rising costs in two areas. First is the high and increasing cost of the town's fire department. Residents have requested and supported a high level of fire and ambulance service that is delivered at a per capita cost that ranks amongst the most costly here in Massachusetts. Second, our high quality regional school system represents approximately 50% of the overall town budget and is increasing at a faster rate than other budgets. We are working closely with the school district on an ongoing basis and hope that we can balance these costs and needs by keeping the school growth to Manchester after apportionment with the town of Essex in the low 3% range. In summary, your town is in good financial shape. The proposed budgets are well constructed based on the best information available and Manchester is well run throughout the year. As a final note, our finance committee meets in public on a regular basis and meetings are open to all. We look forward to your ideas, concerns and suggestions so that we can make better recommendations and best serve the needs of our town. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Maury. As he said, the best way to follow the progress of the meeting is with the Finance Committee report. The pamphlet contains all the warrant articles and the recommendations of the selectmen, as well as those of the Finance Committee. In addition to the pamphlet, there are handouts prepared by the Regional School Committee, the Board of Health, the proponents of Articles 17 and 18, and by resident Michael Carvalho on fluoridation. The School Committee and Article 17 handouts contain the motions to be made under Warrant Articles 18 and 17, I mean, excuse me, 8 and 17, so it's important that everyone have a copy to refer to when we're voting. If you don't have all the handouts, especially on Articles 8 and 17, please raise your hand and one of the tellers will give you what you need. We'll be voting electronically at this meeting. You should have received a keypad like this one as you checked in. We're going to use the keypads for most votes unless I determine that a voice vote may be more efficient. When the voting period for each motion opens, the green light to my left will light up and you'll have 15 seconds to vote. Press 1 to vote yes or 2 to vote no on the motion under consideration. If you change your mind, just press the other button. The commuter records only your last choice. If you want to abstain, don't press either button, or if you've already recorded a yes or a no, press three, and that'll clear your previous choice. The handsets are in sleep mode until a button is pressed, so the, the screen will be blank until you vote. After you vote, the LED in the upper right corner of the handset will show green, indicating that your vote was, rece was received, and the screen will display 1A for yes, 2B for no, or 3C for abstain. And then vice then goes back to sleep. Does any, anyone have any questions about how to use the handsets? The electronic voting system we're using tonight will produce an anonymous log of how each handset was used on each vote. Any voter who wishes to will be able to go to the town clerk's office and determine how his or her votes were recorded. 
And I want to thank resident Jim Starkey for writing the computer program that will enable the town clerk to retrieve that information easily. The town will not create a record linking voters' names with individual handsets, so all votes are secret. That means that if you want to check your voting record with the town clerk, you'll need to write down the device's identifier. It's the six-character alphanumeric code on the back following the words device ID. It's all underneath the barcode. The handsets have all been tested, so it's very unlikely that any will fail to work. But if you don't see the appropriate display after voting or you experience any other problem, you can go to the electronic voting help desk in the front of the gym to my left, and Bayon will give you another. We'll conduct a test vote to make sure everyone is comfortable with the system. Question, will the Red Sox win the World Series again this year? <laughs> when the green light to my left goes on, voting time is open, and you'll have 15 seconds. Press one for yes, and two for, or two for no. Voting's open. And the, yes, the yeses are 158 and the noes are 61. We, we had this same vote last year with pretty much the same result and it worked out pretty well. Are there any questions about how to vote electronically? Please remember to return your handset to one of the bins in the lobby as you leave, and also deposit any papers, water bottles, or other discarded materials in the recycling containers. We'll begin with Article 1. This concerns the reports of town boards and committees, and Margaret Driscoll moves the article as printed in the warrant with the addition of Christos G. Nahadis to the in memoriam section on the first page of the annual report. Eli Bowling seconds the motion, and I'll take this as a voice vote. If you're in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. And that's a unanimous vote. Article two is to set the salaries of elected officers in the town, and Susan Beckman moves the article as printed in the warrant. More equatant seconds, and we'll take this by voice as well. In favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. And that's a unanimous vote. And Article 3 is the assessment for the Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical School District. Rebecca Jakes moves and Margaret Driscoll seconds that the town raise and appropriate $152,731 to be funded by taxation for the purpose of funding the town's share of the North Shore Agricultural and Technical School District. And I'll recognize Jeff Delaney the town's representative on the uh, Technical School District Committee for remarks. Good evening, everyone. I have been asked to explain Manchester's increased district assessment for the North Shore Agricultural and Technical School, or Essex Tech. Basically, the main component driving our increased assessment is our increased enrollment. That, along with the annual budget increases, is why I've seen a jump in the last two years' assessments. Historically, through the years, between Essex Tech and its predecessor, the North Shore Vogue, Manchester has seen enrollment numbers of between one and five children, with one to three being the average. The enrollment minimum per participating town in the Essex Tech district is five. Whether we've had one or five children enrolled, we've been paying for five slots. In 2017, we had five children enrolled. In 2018, we had six, and currently in 2019, we have nine children enrolled, which is where next, preliminary, next year's preliminary enrollment number comes from. With Manchester having 11 applications for next year, that number is surely going to grow. Towns comparable to ours are seeing enrollment numbers in the 30s and growing, and I would expect Manchester to be in that range in the next few years. You may ask yourself, why is our enrollment increasing at this rate? Essex Tech in a short time has become one of the premier technical schools in New England, 
That coupled with the rising cost of post-secondary education and the continual growth, market growth in technical jobs has made technical and vocational careers not only a viable option, but an attractive one. With Essex Tech offering 25 career and technical education programs, one being a new, ed one being a new engineering program this year, there's an abundance of opportunities for students looking for something outside a traditional college preparatory education. Manchester being part of the Essex Tech District complements our already outstanding school system is an, and it is an essential part of Manchester having a balanced education system overall. I would like to thank everyone for your past and continued support of technical education for Manchester children. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Is there further discussion? If you're in favor of this appropriation, please press 1. If you're opposed, please press 2. We have a, we have, we have a glitch here. <clears throat> Now, if you're in favor of this appropriation, please press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. Voting is open. The vote is 200, excuse me. Vote is 227 in favor and 4 opposed. And the appropriation is approved. Article 4 contains the operating budget requests of town departments and committees and includes the recommendations of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen. The report also contains the Finance Committee's recommended source of funding for each item. The requests and recommendations are found at pages 23 through 28 of the Finance Committee pamphlet. And Susan Beckman moves and Maury Creighton seconds that the town raised by taxation or otherwise to pay town debts and charges for the ensuing 12 months, effective July 1, 2019, and appropriate the same, the amounts presented in the expenses budget summary section under the recommended and funding sources columns of the Finance Committee report, pages 27 and 28 under Article 4. Provided, however, that with prior approval of the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee, the town administrator is authorized to transfer Unexpended, unexpended funds within a summary category, for example, within general government. And the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee both recommend approval. And did you want to introduce Article 4, or Maury? Maury has some very brief comments to introduce Article 4. Very brief. Um, this proposed fiscal 2020 budget um, is similar to that of prior years and represents a 2.3 6% increase over last year's budget. On the revenue side, the budget relies on funds generated from real estate taxes, excise taxes, program fees, including the beach and the harbor, and revenue generated from our water and sewer programs. On the expense side, salaries represent 45% of this budget and are increasing by 4.2% in line with the town's contractual agreements, and as mentioned before, for added hours to support help in the Selectman's Office, Town Treasurer, and Conservation Commission, as well as seasonal help for the Harbor Master. Operating mm -hmm. expenses are 27% and are increasing at half a percent. Our town's debt service is decreasing by 21.5%, along with a projected 3.9% decrease in health care cost. Long-term planning and spending controls ensure that the town's operating budget stays in line from year to year. They're always unknowns, including unexpected equipment breakdowns, infrastructure problems, and severe weather and storm problems as we've seen in the past. This fiscal year 2020 operating budget represents a solid plan for the coming year, and we hope that you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Maury. I'll go through Article 4 by major cut budget category, such as general government, and read the total amount recommended for that category by the Finance Committee. If any voter wants to ask a question 
or change the Finance Committee's recommendation on any line item within that category, please call out hold and we'll stop and identify the item number. If any voter wishes to change the Finance Committee's recommended amount on any line item, we'll take those changes as amendments to the main motion that I just read and vote on each one separately. When we've finished all the holds, we'll then vote on the main motion to approve the amounts in the expenses budget summary as amended if there are any changes. Until we've finished all action on Article 4, reconsideration of an individual line item will not require the two-thirds vote generally applicable. General government, 32% of Article 4, items 1 through 32. And I would just note that the heading for items 23 and 24 should read planning department rather than planning board. Total recommended for general government is $4,823,749. Are there any holds under general government? Public safety, 24% of Article 4, items 33 through 49. Total recommended for public safety, $3,493,175. Any holds under public safety? Ms. Wilson. Which item number? Okay, 33, 34, 37, and 38. Public works, 14% of Article 4, items 50 through 58. Total recommended for public works is $2,069,921. Are there any holds under public works? Other environmental, 1% of Article 4, Items 59 through 62. Total recommended for other environmental is $81,532. Any holds under other environmental? Human services. 2% of Article 4, items 63 through 68. Total recommended for human services, $338,965. Any holds? Library, 3% of Article 4, items 69 and 70. Total recommended is $488,810. Any holds under library? Recreation, 2% of Article 4, items 71 through 80. Total recommended for recreation is $355,600. Are there any holds under recreation? Debt service, 9% of Article 4, item 81, total recommended $1,234,763. Is there any hold on debt service? Enterprise funds, 11% of Article 4, items 82 through 86, total recommended for enterprise funds, $1,589,425. Any holds under enterprise funds? The total for Article 4 is $14,275,940, and I have holds on items 33, 34, 37, and 38. And Ms. Wilson, you had the holds on those items. Would you wait for a mic, please? Did you have a question? Yes, please. Wait for the mic, please. Thank you. So I, I'd just like clarification, um, Mr. Creighton, you mentioned that the fire department is extremely expensive, one of the most expensive in the state. But when I look at our police department with 33 salaries and the fire department with 37 salaries, and the difference being that the police department's budget is higher by around about 400000 than the fire department then I don't really quite understand where the issue is that the fire department 
seems to be so expensive. Mr. Creighton. Sure. Um, we were talking specifically about the fire department. Um, some members of our finance committee about two years ago made a fairly exhaustive study of other communities of like size to Manchester, comparing the cost of their fire departments, the equipment, the capital, is sort of a benchmarking effort. And at that time, um, felt that and, and really observed that the, the costs of the Manchester operation, although it provides excellent service, was really at the high end. So we were comparing fire departments with fire departments, not fire departments with police departments, because they're really pretty separate operations. I, I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you, Mark. Maury. Is the meeting ready to vote then on the original motion? If you're in favor of the motion, please press one. If you're opposed, press two. And the motion is approved 224 to 9. And we've completed Article 4, so at this point, the reconsideration rules would apply, will apply, and it'll take a two-thirds vote to go back and revisit anything in Article 4. Article 5 is the capital budget, found on pages 29 and 30 of the Finance Committee report. I'll read the Selectman's main motion, and then we'll identify any holes. We'll vote on the recommended amounts and funding forces, sources excuse me, for all non-hold items, and then we'll go back and take up each hold item separately. And Susan Beckman moves and Maury Creighton seconds that the town appropriate the amounts from the sources stated in the recommendation of the Finance Committee in order to pay the costs of various capital items set forth in Article 5, including payment of all costs incidental and related thereto. Are there any holds? 24. 24? 5, six, and seven? Six and seven. Five and six. Going once. Okay, so we have holds on five, six, and 24. I'm sorry, yes, 17. Yes, do you? Three? Any other holds? So we have holds on 3, 5, 6, 17, and 24. So if you're in favor of Ms. Beckman's motion on all the non-hold items, that's all except 3, 5, 6, 17, and 24, please press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. The motion prevails by a vote of 215 to 7. Okay, so we'll start with item 3. Who has a hold on number 3? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Catherine Howe, 3 Wood Home Lane. I'm just looking for clarification on what this sidewalk tractor is and why we need it. This is Greg Fetterspiel, the town administrator. So this is, sorry. So this, so, uh, now it is, okay. 
So this is a replacement. We have two uh, sidewalk tractors. The one that we're replacing is um, 17 years old. It's an O2, um, so it's uh, past its prime, shall we say. And so this is a replacement to that very old uh, sidewalk tractor. So this gives us two um, fairly, the, the other one we have is a 2016, 2016, Chuck's nodding his head. Um, so this gives, would give us two relatively uh, new uh, vehicles to plow the sidewalks. Further discussion on item three? Well, would you wait for the mic, please? Would you wait for the mic and give us your name and address? <clears throat> uh, Dean Nahadis from Beach Street. Um, the quite, on the sidewalk plow, I wanted to make sure that maybe it would be narrower so it could fit on more sidewalks. Mr. Fetterspiel. Uh, I'm going to turn to Chuck on that one. <laughs> so this is Chuck Dam, the Director of Public Works. Yep, uh, we can look into that. That's pretty much a standard width, but um, yeah, we have a lot of uh, narrow sidewalks. Really, it comes down to how tight they can make the engine because the entire vehicle follows the plow. So we're constricted by that. But. Further discussion? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Melissa Flynn, 62 Bridge Street. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to get something that also sweeps the sidewalks. Mr. Dam. Uh, yep, we're, we're looking into that. It would be an attachment uh, for our wheeled vehicle. So this tractor specifically in this year's budget is a tracked vehicle for plowing sidewalks. For, so it doesn't have the ability to go when there's not snow on the ground, uh, but that would be an attachment for our other uh, wheeled vehicle, and we'll have to look into attachments for that. Thank you, Mr. Dam. Further discussion of item three? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Samantha Markarell, and I'm on Powder House Lane. I know a lot of the equipment, especially the excavator, is very old, and the cost to maintain it and keep it up is what was covered in uh, three, and then also as well in six of this section, um, so you can only maintain the equipment for so long. So I think it's in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion of item three. If you're in favor of the appropriation of $183,000 to be funded by taxation, please press one. If you're opposed, press two. And the motion prevails by a vote of 212 to 18. Item five. Yes, Ms. Bryant. Alida Bryant, 57 Old Essex. I would just like to understand the difference between the requested and the recommended on five and six and any of the others that have huge discrepancies if, they're in, if it's possible to address that. Well, we've already voted the others, so I'm going to yeah, that's, ask yeah. Mr. Fetterspiel. But an explanation would be lovely. I'll, I'll ask Mr. Fetterspiel to explain the differences on five and six. So in five, um, what we have done is split the funding sources. So we're taking 100000 from taxation, and then in question number seven, article seven, you will be voting on another 295000 as a capital exclusion. Um, so actually, we've gone a little higher than that recommended number, um, but taking it from two different pots. Um, and then the, um, the miscellaneous equipment, the reduction, it was really a, a sense of, of balancing and looking at the miscellaneous equipment needs are basically shop equipment, and the, um, it was felt that the $10,000 was sufficient. Thank you. Further discussion on five and six? If you're in favor of the appropriation of $100,000 under item five and $32,000 under item six, both funded by taxation, please press one. That was 10,000. Whoop. We skipped, we skipped all right. Whoop, sorry. Okay, sorry, yep, 10, 10 and 100 for five and 10 for six, both funded by taxation.
We're voting on both of those items. One for yes, two for no. And the appropriation is approved by a vote of 211 to yes, 15, no. Item 17. Wait, wait for the mic, please. Steve Hamilton, 51 Forest Street. Same, really the same question, if someone could explain the difference between uh, recommended and um, requested. Mr. Fetterspiel. So again, uh, different funding sources. We're not doing all of the rehab work that was originally proposed just because of dollars and, and making some choices, but you will see a number of um, projects in Article uh, 9, which is the Community Preservation Fund. So instead of, again, using general taxation, we're doing a number of projects for Park and Rec through the Community Preservation Fund, which will be the subject to Article 9. So the recommended amount for 17 is zero. We don't need to vote that. And the hold on number 24, I think, was Mrs. Dixon? It's really the opposite. Uh, oh, Wendy Dixon, 295 Summer Street. Um, why are we giving them 60% more, 60% more than they have asked, it, asked for? Mr. Fetterspiel, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Fetterspiel. So this was one of those that went the other direction in terms of pricing. Um, and this is to advance the phase two of the dredging and to um, advance the work further along in order to get in line for future grant funding. We wanted to make sure we had as much of that phase two engineering completed. And so we thought we could stretch it over two years, but it's better to consolidate it and get it done in this coming fiscal year. So that's why we've increased that amount. Thank you, Mr. Fetterspiel. Further discussion on 24? If you're in favor of the appropriation of uh, $80,000 funded from the Waterway Fund, please press 1. If you're opposed, press 2. And that appropriation is approved by a vote of 223 to 8. And that concludes Article 5. Article 6 is an appropriation for the purpose of purchasing a new amb ambulance. And Eli Bowling moves and Rebecca Jakes seconds that the town raise and appropriate $270,000 for the purpose of purchasing a new ambulance. Provided, however, that said appropriation shall be contingent upon the approval by the voters of a capital expenditure exclusion question in accordance with General Laws Chapter 59, Section 21C. That's Proposition 2.5. And, and the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen both recommend approval of $270,000. Remarks? Mr. Bowling. So the fire department has two ambulances in order to respond to simultaneously emergency medical calls, which happens about 75 to 100 times per year. The plan is to get rid of the oldest ambulance, which was about 20 years old, and failed in its uh, last date inspection. Our current frontline ambulance will become the backup amb ambulance. We're proposing raising the funds through a capital exclusion, which needs the approval at the ballot box. This is the third year we're using the approach of uh, capital exclusion, which we're planning on doing more of over the next 15 years. We're increasing our capital exclusion request at the same rate as we are decreasing our <coughs> debt exclusion amounts. In this way, we're not increasing our total exclusion through our total taxation through exclusions, and we're saving ourselves on the interest of the debt exclusions. Uh, the amount we're asking for tonight has increased a little bit because when we originally spec'd out the ambulance, we admitted the uh, a stretcher lift device, which require, provides a mechanical assist to lifting a stretcher with its patient into the ambulance. So that's why the amount is up to 270 from, I think it was 255. Thank you, Mr. Bowling. Further discussion? 
If you're in favor, please press one. If you're opposed, press two. The motion prevails by a vote of 222 to 14. Article 7 is the appropriation that Mr. Federspiel mentioned a few minutes ago for drainage and sidewalk repairs. And Margaret Driscoll moves the article as printed in the warrant. Rebecca Jakes seconds. Remarks, Ms. Driscoll. So improving our drainage system and sidewalks is part of the town's overall capital improvement plan. This article proposes to raise the funds through another exclusion vote in which Eli described. It'll combine the ambulance vote and this Article 7 vote on the ballot. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Is there further discussion? And this is, like the previous one, this is a majority vote tonight. It's also a majority vote on both of them at the ballot on the capital exclusion questions. If you're in favor of this appropriation, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. And the motion prevails 217 to 11. Article 8 is the appropriation for the regional school district. And th th there are three motions under this article. They're all printed on the handout that is captioned, I believe, Article 8 motions. And Shannon Erdman of the Regional School District Committee makes motion number one printed on the handout. And Caroline Weld seconds the motion. And I recognize Ms. Erdman for remarks. And you can, you can discuss all three of these motions together. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, members of the Board of Selectmen and Finance Committee, for your continued support. Good evening. MERSD has a terrific story to tell and continues to be one of the top performing districts in our Commonwealth and our country. The district, in collaboration with our partners, has remained an efficient, and responsible steward of your investment. While delivering an excellent education to our students, we have maintained a very even assessment growth of roughly 3.4% per year over the last four years. The budget we present to you tonight shows a 3.2% year-over-year growth. Last fall, the ta taxpayers of Manchester voted overwhelmingly to support the Memorial School Building Project, which will commence in June with a completion date fall of 2021. While this is very exciting, we recognize it will undoubtedly be a little bit disruptive. We are committed to working with the community to minimize inconveniences, so I urge you all, if it applies, to attend uh, the meetings we have scheduled prior to the start of the project to learn more. On May 8th at 7 p.m. at Memorial, we will be meeting with parents. <laughs> May 29th at 7 p.m., we will meet, be meeting with the Butters again. So please, I encourage you to attend those meetings if you have any questions. After the project begins, there will be point persons assigned to various issues which may arise, so please stay tuned for announcements on who to contact. Uh, before I close, I would like to leave you with some, some extremely positive news regarding the financing of this project. Mr. Creighton stole my thunder a little bit here. MERSD has recently issued $35 million in bonds at 3.28%, which is lower than the 5% projection we used last fall. This will result in $17 million of savings over the life of the bonds. This is a 22% savings over the original projection, and our S&P credit rating remains an extremely high AA plus. As always, your school committee and MERSD community is profoundly grateful for your support and your dedication. Thank you, and go Hornets. Thank you, Ms. Urban. 
the, the gist of, of motion number one is simply to approve the existing allocation formula between the towns of Manchester and Essex. Nothing is changing. We're just re we're required by state law to approve this annually every year. So that's why this is in here. Further discussion under motion number one? If you're in favor, please press one. Opposed, press two. And the motion is approved, approved by a vote of 214 to 6. And Ms. Urban makes motion number 2 as printed on the handout, and Caroline Weld seconds. Is there discussion under motion number 2? If you're in favor, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. The motion is approved with 196 yes and 17 no votes. And finally, Ms. Erdman makes motion number three is printed on the handout, and Caroline Weld seconds. Is there discussion? If you're in favor, please press one. Opposed, press two. The motion is approved by a vote of 197 to 13. Article 9 is the report of the Community Preservation Committee. We'll follow the same procedure for these appropriations that we use for the capital budget. I'll read the CPC's motion, then ask for holds, and then we'll vote on all the non-hold items and go back and take up any holds separately. And Sue Thorne, the co-chair of the Community Preservation Committee, moves, and Ron Mastrogiacomo of the Community Preservation Committee seconds. The article is presented in the warrant with the following clarifications. Items one and six to be funded from FY 2020 estimated receipts for the purposes stated in the article. Items two through five and seven through 12 to be funded from the FY 2019 undesignated fund balance for the purposes stated in the article, with the exception of items three and five, which are both for open space and recreation purposes, not for historic preservation. And I recognize Sue Thorne for remarks. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The State Community Preservation Act allows those communities that have adopted the act to recommend for voter approval funding for three categories, community housing, open space and recreation, and historic preservation, along with up to 5% for administrative expenses. Manchester generates its community preservation funding through a local property tax surcharge and a state, excuse me, state distribution based on those surcharges. Currently, the Master Manchester surcharge is one and a half percent. Manchester adopted the Community Preservation Act in 2005. Since that time, just over $4 million in funding has been approved to support projects for both the town and local organizations. Of that $4 million, $1 million has been provided by the State Community Preservation Trust Fund. Our application our application season starts in late September. We then meet to review and evaluate each application, and in February, we submit our recommendations to the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen for their review, comments, and support. This year, the CPC received 14 applications. After considering them, two were rejected as not meeting the requirements for funding. The 12 recommendations that you have before you this evening 
have each had discussion with the applicant, followed by careful review by our committee. We feel each of these articles meets criteria spelled out by the Act and is worthy of financial support. We are pleased that both the Board of the Selectmen and the Finance Committee support these items as well. We now ask you, the voters, for your approval so that these projects can move forward. We urge you to support this article with a vote on Article, uh, with a vote yes on Article 9. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Thorne. Are there any holds on any of the items? And we'll vote on Mrs. Thorne's motion with respect to all of them. If you're in favor, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. The motion is approved by a vote of 217 to 10. Article 10 is an appropriation for funding expenses to the celebration of the town's 375th anniversary. And Margaret Driscoll moves to transfer $10,000 from the town's undesignated fund balance to a new account for the purpose of paying expenses of the 375th Anniversary Celebration Committee. And Eli Bowling seconds. Remarks, Mrs. Driscoll. The 375th Anniversary Committee is well underway developing plans for a celebration of the founding for, of our town. These funds will complement private monies raised in support of all the events. Tom Keogh, a member of the committee, has some additional information he'd like to share about the committee's work to date. Thank you, Mrs. Driscoll. Mr. Kehoe. If you had eight months on the over-under from the time I left the Board of Selectmen until I would get appointed to another committee, you were correct. So eight months was the correct over-under. Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to bring to your attention Article 10, asking for $10,000 from fund balance for the startup funding for the town's 375th anniversary celebration in 2020. A core group of volunteers have been meeting for two plus months now to start planning for the celebration. We do not plan to rival the 350th, but to allow residents of all ages to learn about the history of the town and celebrating by participating in many 375th anniversary events. We are planning youth events, family events, and adult events. We are working on events that are water-based, town-based, and woods and conservation land-based. Throughout our year-long celebration, we hope to sponsor or co-sponsor 12 events. Our hope is that many of these events will be low or no cost to the residents. Our fundraising work has already started with the production of a fantastic wooden puzzle of the quilt that hangs in the Board of Selectmen's office. We are also looking forward to the production of a 375th anniversary calendar and other celebration year merchandise available to sell. This Bless you. This expenditure of $10,000 will allow the committee to make deposits as necessary to get our fundraising off the ground and plan our events. We will also be looking for sponsors for our calendar and some events to support the celebration. Any funds left over at the end of the celebration will be returned to the town or support a commemorative anniversary newspaper dealing uh, excuse me, detailing the year-long celebration enjoyed by members of the, citizen, of, of the citizenry. If you wish to be involved in this effort or volunteer your organization for inclusion in the 375th celebration, please contact me tonight or through the Selectman's office. I'm available to take questions on Article 10. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Keogh. Further discussion? If you're in favor of that appropriation, please press one. Opposed, press two. The 
and that appropriation is approved by a vote of 226 to 10. Article 11 is an appropriation to the other post-employment benefits trust fund. And Eli Bowling moves and Susan Beckman seconds that the town transfer from the undesignated fund balance $258,311 for the purpose and subject to the condition stated in the article. Is there discussion? If you're in favor of that transfer, please press one. Opposed, press two. And that transfer is approved by a vote of 205 to 11. <coughs> Excuse me. And Article 12 concerns a, a requirement that we are uh, mandated by state law to do every year. And Rebecca Jakes moves the article as printed in the warrant in Eli Bowling's seconds. Is there discussion? If you're in favor, please press one. Opposed, press two. <coughs> Excuse me. The motion is approved by a vote of 211 to three. Article 13 is a, <clears throat> an amendment to the general bylaw, and I suggested, recommended to the selectmen that they include it in the warrant because it pertains to the method of voting at town meeting. So I won't moderate this discussion. With the consent of the meeting, I'll appoint Jay Bothwick, <clears throat> excuse me, to serve as assistant moderator for this article. Is there any objection? Hearing none, I appoint Jay Bothwick as assistant moderator. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, this probably reminds uh, many of you of the first time you gave the keys to your son or daughter shortly after they, get, they got their license. <laughs> so, um, you know, with your assistance, I'll try to return the car in one piece. So I'll uh, recognize Mr. Alan Wilson for the motion and some remarks. Mr. Jay, Wilson. I was a lot more nervous the first time I gave him the keys. <laughs> um, I move the article as printed in the warrant with the addition of Subsection D, the moderator and town clerk shall ensure that any electronic voting system used pursuant to this bylaw produces an anonymous log of all votes recorded so that a voter may retain his or her handset identifier and determine after the meeting dissolves how his or her votes were recorded. And Susan Beckman has kindly agreed to second that motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Any discussion? Well, no, I have a comment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, Mr. If, Moderator, if I may. You may. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, the principal purpose of this amendment is simply to recognize uh, and incorporate into the general bylaw electronic voting, which, as you know, we've been using for a couple of years now. Um, the addition of subsection D, the one I just read, is in re response to a legitimate concern um, raised by some voters uh, that we ought to have a way of verifying that the electronic system recorded uh, individuals' votes correctly. And so that's the purpose of Section D, is to include that as a mandate that the town clerk and the moderator will have to follow. As I mentioned in my opening comments, the system we're using tonight does contain such capability, and we've tested it, and it works. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Well, is the meeting ready to vote? Uh, this is a majority vote to amend the general bylaw. If you're in favor, please press one. If you're opposed, please press two. And the motion prevails by a vote of 224 in favor and six against. 
Thanks for your kind attention. I'll now turn the keys back over to our moderator, <laughs> Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, and thank you all. Article 14 is another amendment to the general bylaw, and Margaret Driscoll moves the article as printed in the warrant, and Susan Beckman seconds. Remarks, Mrs. Driscoll. So this is a housekeeping article. Uh, by approving this amendment to our general bylaws, we are codifying the general practice of filing all town boards and committee minutes with the town clerk's office, which is the storehouse for all of the official town documents. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Is there discussion? This is also a majority of vote. If you're in favor, please press one. Oops, excuse me. Mr. Gates. To Desmond Avenue. Uh, Mr. Gates, let me suggest that you move a little further away from the speaker because you're likely to get some feedback. It won't be positive feedback either. <laughs> Far enough away? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to know if this uh, fully meets the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act, uh, where I remember reading at one time that at least a draft minute should be available uh, much closer to the date of the meeting rather than the date of approval, which in this town sometimes takes a month, two months, three months before uh, meetings are voted on for approval. I'm going to ask town council, Michelle Randazzo, to respond to that question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Through you to the meeting. Good evening, everyone. The Attorney General's office amended its regulations last fall to specify that board and committee meeting minutes should be approved within three meetings or 30 days, whichever is later. So for those town boards and committees that meet less frequently, they have a little longer. For those that meet uh, more frequently, the expectation is, is that meeting minutes will be generated in a, a timely fashion. So the seven days reference in this general bylaw really is um, for filing and placement of those minutes with the town clerk, which isn't actually specifically addressed in, in the open meeting law. So there's no conflict there. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Randazzo. Further discussion? If you're in favor of the, the amendment, this, as I mentioned, is a majority vote, please press one. Opposed, press two. And the amendment is approved by a vote of 206 to 13. And Article 15 is another amendment to the general bylaw. <coughs> Excuse me. And Eli Bowling moves the article as printed in the warrant, but with the word fine changed to late fee in both places where it appears. And Rebecca Jakes seconds the motion. Remarks, Mr. Bowling. So in 2012, the town updated its animal control bylaws based on a major update to the state statutes that same year. Now when we did that, we omitted a section that included provisions for assessing late fees for licensing dogs. So this article remedies that with a fine of $27,468.43 per month past the due date, up to a maximum of three months or for a total of $82,405.29 per dog. <laughs> now, uh, we talked to the town clerk, clerk about the proposed fines, and she said, uh, quote, I'm so tired of always having to chase down late payers for dog licenses. This'll fix them. 
<laughs> they get one of these babies and they'll never be late for anything again. <laughs> Maybe they'll even be on time for dinner parties instead of making people stand around, for, or everyone stand around watching the food get cold, unquote. Now, um, this is actually a pretty intimidating conversation and the board really didn't think it would be a good idea to cross her on this. So we're really asking for your support on Article 15. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bowen. <laughs> You're very welcome. Just, just in case anyone's in doubt, the motion is for a fine of $10 per month up to a total uh, excuse me, a late fee of $10 per month up to a total of 30 Is there further discussion? If you're in favor, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. The motion does not prevail. No, it does. <laughs> it prevails by a vote of 216 to 12. Article 16 is an authorization to acquire a gift for conservation purposes. Rebecca Jakes moves the article as printed in the warrant, and Eli Bowling seconds. The Finance Committee is not taking a position on this article. Uh, Article 4, Section 8 of the Town's General Bylaw provides that no acquisition of an interest in real property shall be authorized by town meeting unless it has been referred to the Planning Board, and the Planning Board has made a report to the Town. And the Planning Board met on March 25th, 2019, and I have their report, and it recommends acceptance of this gift by the Town. Remarks? Mrs. Jakes. This parcel of land, uh, heavily constrained by a stream that runs down the middle and extensive wetlands on either side, is currently owned by the House of Seven Gables, a nonprofit museum in Salem. The museum was given the property back in the 1960s and has no need to continue to own the property. They are seeking your approval to give the land to the town for conservation purposes. While we have no concerns regarding this parcel, we will be going forward having all potential land donations vetted by multiple boards and committees to ensure no negative financial impacts exist. And again, we have no concerns with this parcel. Thank you, Ms. Jakes. Is there a discussion? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Palermo. Um, hi, Mary Palermo, Two Parsons Lane. I'm just wondering, before it gets gifted to us, what is the amount of monies we're collecting in taxes on it? Mr. Federspiel. So because it's owned by a nonprofit currently, um, it's not paying any taxes. So we haven't collected any taxes on this since the mid-60s. Thank you. Further discussion? If you're in favor of accepting this gift, please press 1. Opposed, press 2. And the motion is approved by a vote of 226 to 7. And Article 17 is a proposed addition to the general bylaw. And Gary Gilbert moves to amend Article 10 of the town's general bylaw by adopting new section 44 as printed on the handout titled Motion under Article 17. Does everybody have that handout? And Allison Anold White, the chair of the Sustainability Committee, seconds the motion. Remarks, Mr. Gilbert. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, first off, I'd like to dedicate this effort to Sam and Nita Adams, who've left us, but they always encouraged me and others to play an active role for the betterment of our town. Um, 
In researching this law, a couple of interesting facts rose to the top besides dead whales and dead sea turtles and such. Um, I think it was really impressive that about 50% to 75% of the plastic in the ocean is foodware related. That, that fact alone I found quite astounding. Um, and they do multi-year studies just to come up with these statistics. The other point worth making is that plastics are not a single chemical. Many of them have impurities in them and contam different uh, uh, carcinogenic products and such that can come out once they're exposed to the environment they were intended to be in, um, acids or heat or the ocean water, et cetera. This law specifically um, ex uh, will stop the use of three of the seven plastics out there, the, some, the plastic called PEAT, PVC, and polystyrene. Other plastics are allowed as long as they're in a recyclable form. Other alternative products are allowed, like cardboard products, bamboo, and something called bioplastics, which is a new technology that's been emerging pretty much since we started our plastic bag ban about five years ago, made from organic products, and they can degrade in the environment. Also, any items packaged outside of town are allowed to be sold. If that wasn't the case, Crosby's would be half empty, three quarters empty probably, um, and the hardware store would affect their shelves their supplies. So items that are prepared outside of town are allowed, they're excluded. We spoke to um, all the businesses we could think of that this would affect, and many of them um, pretty much sort of welcomed this and they took the information. Black Arrow is already complying completely. He was quite proud of that. Calas has those, those alternative plastic straws already. Um, the Essex County Club said some or most of his stuff has already been switched over. As far as he knows, I think he needs to study the law a bit. Um, so the changes in the handout here, if I was just to hit the main reasons for them, um, we, we vetted this as much as we could. We went back and forth with town council. We got comment from the town administrator, everybody that we could that um, put, gave their input. And most of the comments are for clarity and consistency. They're also to add the building inspector to play an active role in this instead of uh, the Board of Health. I would add that since we passed our ban on plastic bags, there's been no uh, violations, so he may not have to be too busy. Um, the um, medicines, medicine bottles are excluded because that's just too complicated a subject. There's too many sizes of them and there aren't alternatives, as far as I know, for all the products they, they use. The changes also allow for appeals, an appeals process, and to shorten the time that it would take to go into effect from six months to three months. So I would just say that um, our town has sort of developed a reputation. We were the second in the state to ban plastic bags and a lot of people in the green community in the state know about us and are encouraging what we're doing now. Right now there's about 99 towns that have banned plastic bags and we were definitely a leader in that effort. If we pass this tonight, we would be the fifth uh, town uh, in the state to have um, regulated these all this set of products. So I would just ask you to vote yes, and let's make this the last straw. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. And I'll recognize Rebecca Jakes for the recommendation of the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen, oh, sorry. The Board of Selectmen support Article 17. As Gary mentioned, Manchester by the Sea was the second in the state to ban plastic bags. Since that time, 97 other communities have followed suit. We are all aware of the significant amount of styrofoam and plastic litter we see on the streets and the beaches. As a seaside community whose beach is a significant asset, both aesthetically and financially, we can again help lead the way in regulating plastic product and byproduct. Thank you, Ms. Jakes. Further discussion? Yes, ma'am. Kathy Graves. I live on um, Newport Park Road. Only been here a few years. I have a question. The train comes through in the summertime and hundreds of people get off. You're saying, and they go to the beach here, and you're saying here, no plastic, uh, no styrofoam picnic baskets. 
what are you going to do with those people that bring them on the train into our town? Is there going to be some sort of plastic police officer or something? Mr. Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Um, this is just regulating what stores and businesses can give out for free or sell in our town. Anybody from out of town can bring in what they bring in. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Further discussion? Mr. Keogh. Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, while I appreciate what Mr. Gilbert has done, and I do like the article, I wish, just like I mentioned when we did the plastic bags, that it was passed by the legislature so everybody in the entire state would be affected by this in the same manner. I see that the plastic bag work is coming up to the legislative body this Thursday and possibly for a possible um, move into the entire state. I am concerned, and I've already talked this over with Mr. Gilbert and the town clerk, I am concerned with the date of implementation being set for July 1st. Mr. Gilbert has made enough effort to get in touch with different restaurants and businesses that would be affected by this. But when I talked to him on Saturday morning, I listed out five places that had seasonal or year-round restaurant or food licenses, and he hadn't talked to any of those. It also affects the school system. We need to be able to get the information out to these people. The other reason that I have a problem with this is that tonight we are presently voting on bylaw alteration change number four. The town clerk has 30 days after the end of our town meeting to submit to the Attorney General's office the minutes of the meeting and the vote certification information for each of these bylaw changes. The Attorney General in that office then has up to 90 days to look at that information and either come back to us and say, yours are fine, they've all been approved, or you have to make this particular change on this particular bylaw. Once that comes back, then the town, town clerk then has to notify people in this community for two weeks in the newspaper telling them that these bylaws are now in effect. It makes no sense, to ha in my mind, to have a bylaw coming due or possibly going on the books on July 1st when it could be 120 to 135 days, which would put us halfway through the month of August before we get approval. So with that in mind, and uh, Mr. Moderator and Ms. Town Clerk, after talking to Mr. Gilbert, I would like to propose an amendment to General Bylaw Section 44, Food Wear and Polystyrene Reduction Bylaw, as written in the handout, Section G, Enactment, to read as follows. This bylaw shall go into effect as of October 1st, 2019. Mr. Moderator, that is a change from the page that I gave you. I understand. October 1st, 2019. I believe it uh, makes a lot more me, sense. Mr. Keogh, excuse me. Is, is that amendment seconded? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Keogh. Further discussion on either Mr. Gilbert's motion or Mr. Keogh's amendment? I don't see any hands. So we'll vote first then on Mr. Kehoe's amendment, which is to change the effective date from January 1, excuse me, from July 1, 2019 to October 1, 2019. If you're in favor of that change, please press one. If you're opposed, press two.
And Mr. Kehoe's amendment, excuse me, Mr. Kehoe's amendment is approved by a vote of 178 to 57. So we'll vote, we'll vote then on Mr. Gilbert's motion as amended. So it would be the motion is contained in the handout, but with an effective date under section G of October 1, 2019. If you're in favor of that, please press one. Opposed, press two. And that motion is approved by a vote of 214 to 21. And Article 18 concerns fluoridation of the town's drinking water supply. And Jessica McGovern moves that the meeting answer the following question. Do you want industrial sodium fluoride added to the public water supply? And Joanna Keefe seconds the motion. Remarks, Ms. McGovern. We need to lower the microphone a little bit. Hi, everyone. Is that okay? That's good. This process started with my friends and neighbors talking about spring water. None of us drink public water. Even our town hall doesn't drink public water. They have fluoride-free spring water for everyone at town hall, located next to the Board of Health office. The sodium fluoride added to our water supply is not the same as calcium fluoride that occurs in our water. Calcium fluoride originates in rocks. The artificial sodium fluoride is imported from China. Their certificate of analysis at our DPW also states sodium fluoride is contaminated with heavy metals and lead. Hundreds of peer-reviewed studies showing harm are cataloged in PubMed.gov. PubMed is a part of the U.S. National Library of Medicine. There is no consensus within our government departments. The EPA states it is a substantial developmental neurotoxicant and regulates fluoride as a water contaminant. The FDA has only approved topical use of pharmaceutical grade fluoride in toothpaste, and that toothpaste comes with a poison warning. The first use for sodium fluoride listed on our DPW material safety data sheet is used as an insecticide. This kills ants and roaches. When used as an insecticide, it is illegal to dispose of it any down drains. We dispose around 600 pounds a year in our outer harbor. Insecticide does not turn into fairy dust for dental health. That's fallacy. It's cheap and easy to buy fluoridated toothpaste and fluoridated bottled water if you want it, but expensive and almost impossible to remove sodium fluoride chemicals in our town water that harms many, including pregnant mothers and infants. Over 53 studies have linked fluoride with reduced IQ in children. Based on the environmental impact from steady addition of insecticide to our waterways, and the questionable ethics dosing water for, with sodium fluoride that is harmful to some consumers and the freedom to make our own health choices. We urge the town selectmen take the necessary legislative action to exempt Manchester from the state fluoridation law. Please vote no. And I just wanted to show you these are few of many books from a veterinarian, a dentist, and a doctor that show the harm of from fluoride. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rowan. <clears throat> I'll recognize Dr. Deborah Bradley of the Board of Health. Good evening, Mr. Moderator and uh, fellow Manchester voters. Extensive research has demonstrated that fluoridative water significantly reduces tooth decay. Water consumed as a young child, actually, um, let me restart.
Based on our evaluation of the great wealth of research on water fluoridation, the Board of Health recommends a yes vote on Warren Article 18 to continue adding fluoride to our water. Fluoride is a mineral, just like chlorine, that exists naturally in most water. The untreated drinking water in our area, before it hits the water plant, contains 0.3 parts per million of fluoride. Our ocean water, on average, contains 1.4 parts per million of fluoride. There's been, um, the fluoridation process simply adjusts this to 0.7 parts per million from 0.3, just the minimal amount to prevent tooth decay. There's been no credible evidence of any harm to humans, animals, or the environment at this incredibly low level. Sodium fluoride comes from phosphate rock. During the manufacturing process, the hydrogen fluoride vapor formed from this rock is distilled to 99% purity. We order our, our, our fluoride from a pur purchasing consortium here in New England. Um, their buying site indicates there's no available source of sodium fluoride to purchase that's manufactured in the United States. The sodium fluoride re received does come from China. And to guarantee we receive fluoride that's free of contaminants, it is tested and certified for purity at multiple levels by the independent National Science Foundation inspectors. They test during unannounced inspections at the manufacturing level, as well as en route and at transfer stations and storage depots. Our fluoride is inspected and tested four times from the manufacturing level to its arrival here in Manchester. From those inspections, a certificate of analysis is generated, which documents the screening that's been done for any evidence of contamination. All testing meets strict national, international, and state standards for purity. Locally, our fluoride levels are constantly monitored. Our water sources are tested daily at Gravely Pond and Lincoln Street Well, and that's where we get our natural um, fluoride levels from. At our water treatment plant, we have an online fluoride analyzer that runs constantly. Extensive research has demonstrated that fluoridated water significantly reduces tooth decay. Water consumed as a young child makes the loss of teeth less likely when that child is a middle-aged adult. And for adults, fluoridated water reduces decay uh, by, 20, by 27%. <clears throat> It helps prevent decay along receding gum lines, it decreases the loss of fillings, and it ultimately decreases the loss of teeth. Few topics have been as thoroughly researched as fluoridation. More than 3,000 studies have been published on the subject. The overwhelming weight of the evidence, including more than 65 years of experience, supports its safety and effectiveness. There is no well-designed, peer-reviewed, reputable research that demonstrates harm from fluoride at the extremely, extremely low level used to fluoridate water. Supplementing water with fluoride to prevent cavities is similar to supplementing water with chlorine to prevent other types of disease. It's similar to fortifying salt with iodine, milk with vitamin D, orange juice with calcium, and bread and cereal with folic acid. Water fluoridation is safe, legal, ethical, and effective. And that's why the Board of Health recommends a yes vote on Warren Article 18. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. And I'm going to recognize Eli Bowling for the Board of Selectmen's recommendation. So the petitioners of Article 18 came before the Board of Selectmen in 2018 to request the Board Act to obtain permission from the state to stop supplementing the town water with fluoride. Selectmen asked the Board of Health to weigh in. It was the Board of Health's opinion that the town not change our current practice. Additionally, they felt that if the issue was to be considered, it should be put to a vote by town meeting as the decision to add fluoride to the water was a town ballot vote originally in 1982. Board of Selectmen considered the request and the input from the Board of Health and decided it was not necessary for us to take action at this time. The petitioners were told that they could raise the issue at town meeting if they so chose. 
When the board considered whether or not to recommend approval or disapproval of the petitioner's article in the warrant, it was felt that since this was a non-binding measure, seeking input from the town, we should remain neutral or recommend the advice of the Board of Health. However, a few points about the particulars of the article gave us pause. First, the article as written is ambiguous, the wording vague, and can only be put in context through the comments of the petitioner. Regardless of its non-binding nature, the article does not, through its wording, provide clear direction for action by the board. Second, and more concerning to the board, the language of the article introduces bias. In general, articles brought to town meeting floor are worded in a neutral manner, articulating an action or a request. Petitioners, be they residents or boards, then present their positions on the articles on the floor, leaving the voters to decide on the merits of the concrete effects of the article. The wording of this article seems to bias a voter towards the position of the petitioners before any other statement is made. The board shares the position of the Board of Health. We do not feel that there is any need to change the town's fluoridation policy at this time, and therefore we recommend a yes vote on this article. Thank you, Mr. Bowling. One, one more point I want to cover before we open the uh, discussion to the floor of the meeting. This issue is a little bit complicated because under the state law that allows cities and towns to fluoridate their water, there's a very specific process that a town or a city has to go through. Manchester followed that process to begin fluoridating in 1982. But the statute doesn't provide any mechanism by which a town can decide to stop fluoridating its water. As Mark Twain said, no one is safe when the legislature is in session. <laughs> but I, wanted, I, wanted have the, I want the meeting to understand what process we would have to follow were we to take action that would be binding. This, this uh, motion is not binding. So I'll ask Michelle Randazzo to explain very briefly what her advice is that we would help as to what we would have to do to conduct the legal process that would allow us to stop fluoridating. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, through you. Good evening again, folks. So as both the warrant article and the commentary uh, on the article suggest, the vote you take tonight would be a non-binding. Um, and that's because the state statute, as the moderator suggests, does not provide an actual pathway to discontinuing fluoridation. And so we've opined both in Manchester and in other communities that in order to effectuate that, there would need to be a, a vote of town meeting to authorize the selectmen to seek a home rule petition from the legislature. And that home rule petition would provide both the pathway, the identify the pathway, and authorize that pathway to discontinue fluoridation. But that would mean a new town meeting vote under a properly framed warrant article that would define what those parameters for the special uh, legislation or home rule petition would be. Thank you, Ms. Randazzo. Mr. White. Thank you. I'm Nick White. I uh, live at Nine Spy Rock Hill. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a physicist. I'm not a chemist. I have worked for 30 years or so with fluorides, and I've been concerned with the safety and acted for the safety in industrial settings. And I have a few comments on both sides of this. Briefly, I would say that the level of fluoridation that we use at 0.7 parts per million uh, is pretty benign, but we have to be very careful, and we need to think about what the issues are. The um, federal and state recommendations are 0.7 parts per million, but the recommendation that's stated for the town in the, in the 2016 water quality report states that our goal is one part per million, which is higher. So that needs to be clarified and corrected. 0.7 is the state recommendation. Uh, how safe is 0.7? I have in my hand some graphs collected over 15 years by the EPA on two effects that fluoride has. One is on dental decay, and the other is on fluoridosis, fluorosis, I'm sorry, which is uh, an effect that fluorine, fluoride has, causing discolored teeth, brittle bones, and damage, and is very prevalent and very visible and very easy to find. And so a statement which we heard, that fluoride produces no harmful effects, is quite simply egregiously false. And the fluorosis is visible, 
one needs to be aware of it. The incidence is visibly dropping as you take the concentration from one part per million down to 0.7 parts per million. But the data is affected by many other factors, and I want to mention some. One is topical application of fluoride, which is a good way of making your teeth tougher, and this is good for children. It's in your toothpaste. But the fluoride in toothpaste is not benign. I have a tube of fluoridated toothpaste right here. For a four-year-old child, a four-year-old child tend not to spit out the toothpaste, they tend to consume it. Two of these are fatal, according to the data published in the material safety data sheet, which is issued by Fisher Scientific, which is the one I consulted, and which matches all the others I've looked at. So, should you consume two of these and you're four years old, you'll die. If you're an adult, five tubes. Um, I also want to bring to your attention something that happened in Camelford in the UK about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, where a contractor who was delivering a chemical to a waterworks dumped it in the wrong tank, poisoned 60,000 people. It wasn't fluoride, and it wasn't fatal in most cases. But when we're adding deliberate chemicals to our water supply, we should be aware of the possibility of mistakes, and we should weigh those risks. My personal position is the 0.7 ppm isn't very harmful, doesn't do much good either. If you look at the curves, topical application of fluoride, that means brushing your teeth with fluoride toothpaste, or having your dentist put on a topical application, is good. And it's put on your teeth, and it's not applied to your whole body. So putting it in the water is not a great idea. So I'm not taking a position either side on this, and it wouldn't make any difference if I did. I just wanted to put in some perspectives on the situation. Thank you, Mr. White. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Wait for the mic, please. <clears throat> Elaine Conway, and I'm at 105 Beach Street. Um, I just wanted to say I had a medical situation that caused me to look into the fluoride in our drinking water. And um, I remember I had cut out a year ago an article in the Cricket which addressed this issue. So I dug it out and looked at it. And it showed the bag of fluoride that's put into our drinking water. <clears throat> It actually has a skull and crossbones on it, and it has the word poison written across it. Um, so I guess that the point I want to try to make is, is that it's not a vitamin or what added to our drinking water, it's a poison. So then the second question is, you know, how safe, you know, that it is a poison, but they're giving us a safe level of that poison. So, um, the thing is, you know, what is safe for everybody? For the size of a child as opposed to a big man? Um, how about lifestyles? Some people go out and eat a lot. Some people cook, and they're going to make soup with the fluoridated water, jello, fluoridated water, ice cubes in your drink, fluoridated water. Um, and the other thing is showering. Some people take more than a shower a day. And it has been shown that toxins in your water actually are absorbed through your skin. And so the other point is, there's also more products that we have that when we first voted to put fluoride in the water. I mean, there's fluoride in the toothpaste, there's fluoride rinses, I think I have fluoride in my mouthwash. I mean, so there may be other fluoride in other products. So what is the amount of fluoride that, we're, that we've been given? The other thing is, what is the risk-benefit ratio? Um, I may have good teeth, but what diseases am I going to get? And, you know, um, I learned when I was in nursing school many years ago that what does not um, pass the placenta to nourish the newborn is not good for your body. And that fluoride was one of those elements that does not pass the placenta and is not, and therefore, I assume, not really good for the body. So, um... The other thing is, we know it comes from China. I don't even buy any food from China. So, I mean, they're trying to tell us it is safe. 
I, I, I think just the idea it comes from China is an issue as well. So um, I think that, um, you know, we all, a lot of us buy bottled water. Why are we buying bottled water if the water is so safe and so good for our teeth and everything else? I mean, everybody up here is bottled water. Um, so my question is this. I think the people who, put, who worked hard to get in, in the water years ago, um, you know, didn't have the availability of the research that we have today. And so I just want to end with saying that, you know, a yes vote will say that they're going to continue to use the substance from China and put it in our water. A no vote will have them look into the problem deeper to see exactly what we are, are, are using. And it will be a step toward more pure water and a healthier body. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Cavallo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Carvalho to Jersey Lane. Um, I'm troubled by this discussion. This is an alarmist, misleading, inaccurate uh, warrant article. It shows bias. The Center for Disease Control has recognized that water fluoridation is one of the 10 greatest public health achievements of the 20th century. More than 100 leading organizations in medicine and healthcare recognize that fluoride in water is safe and effective to prevent cavities for all. Community fluoridation is recommended by nearly all public health, medical, and dental organizations. It's recommended by the American Dental Association, the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics, the US Public Health Service, and the World Health Organization. It's also recommended by the Institute of Medicine. There's a handout that has uh, over 100 different uh, agencies, both uh, national and internationally recognized agencies that support the fluoridation of drinking water. Fluoride has been added for the last 70 years and has had great benefit. These scare tactics are concerning to me. The reference to ma uh, material safety data sheets that are being used uh, to mislead this discussion, and that troubles me. Coca-Cola has phosphoric acid in it. A bag of Cheetos my daughter ate for lunch today has sodium diacetate. Both are considered carcinogens and poisons. An intelligent discussion in this area will rely on health professionals, scientists, and folks that have studied this. There is one prominent study that, was, that uh, Harvard commissioned many years ago, and it has been challenged. It excluded approximately 97% of the data points that were considered in it. You wouldn't let your children swim in a swimming pool that didn't have chlorine in it. Fluoride is no worse for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cavalli. <laughs> Further discussion? Yes, Mrs. Keith. Hello, Mr. Moderator. This is Johanna Keefe from 8 Victoria Road. Um, I want to just make the point regarding the sheet that was just referred to on all the organizations that support fluoridation. Um, there are three exceptions to this list that I, I just wanted to make clear that either have left the list or just choose not to be on the list. That is the Alzheimer's Association, the National Kidney Foundation, and the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology. And you notice, uh, you might notice that there is also no veterinarian association on this list. There is also no European organization on this list except for Britain, and there's only 10% in England that support fluoridation. There were many false statements made about fluoride that um, link it to the fluoride that comes from rock. It's not the same fluoride. I also wanted to make the point that since when do we base our personal health decisions 
on government organizations that are captured by profit-driven industry. Since when do we not question our government organizations? History has shown that we used to use asbestos in schools. We used to allow lead and gasoline. We used to use DDT. And, and there are those of us who question mercury in our dental offices. Now, my dentist questions the Teflon on Glide dental floss and refuses to allow his patients to use it in the office. So I, I would like to suggest that we vote no to continue to encourage our town selectmen to look deeper into this. Remember, this is a non-binding vote. Um, we should always question, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keith. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Allen. I'd like to make a motion to modify the wording of Article 18 from what's written in the handout. Uh, what is your amendment? I would like to remove the wording starting with the parenthesis according to the Town Department of Public Works, DPW, the natural excuse me, the material safety data sheet for this chemical also states used as an insecticide and warns to not release into the sewers and waterways. The revised wording would be to ask the town the following question, do you want industrial fluoride, excuse me, fluoride added to the public water supply? This is a non-binding vote. Well, Mr. Allen, that, that was uh, Jessica McGovern's motion. Her motion was, she moves that the meeting answer the following question. Do you want industrial sodium fluoride added to the public water supply? The language you were quoting was in the warrant article, but it was not in her motion. Okay. So, so that language is out already. All right, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Yes. I'm Colleen no, no, Brown. No, Ms. Brown, I recognize this lady here. It's Mary Jo Feuerbach. I'm at 5 Herald Street. I wanted to make a motion to cut off debate. That's the motion to cut off debate. That's the motion for the previous question. I heard a second. And that motion is not debatable. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go to a vote on the motion to cut off debate. If you're in favor of cutting off debate, please press one. If you're opposed, press two. This is a two-thirds vote. And the motion to, for the previous question prevails by a vote of 184 to 47, which is more than two thirds. So we'll vote then on the original motion, which is to answer the following question. Do you want industrial sodium fluoride added to the public water supply? I wanna be, I wanna be sure everyone understands what we're voting on here, because this is a little different. We normally vote on actions. Here we're voting to answer this question. So. If you want sodium fluoride added to the public water supply, please press one for yes. And if you do not want sodium fluoride <clears throat> added to the public water supply, please press two for no. The voting period is open. And the vote is 143 yes to 80 no. So a majority of that vote favored continuing fluoridation of the water. And Article 19 concerns an appropriation of $45,000 for the purchase of electronic voting equipment for a town meeting. Margaret, well, I should ask. Are we, are, we, are we moving it or not? <laughs> okay. 
The Selectman's recommendation on this article obviously depended on whether or not the system we're using worked tonight. <laughs> and their, their recommendation is that we approve it. So Margaret Driscoll moves and Rebecca Jakes seconds that the town transfer from the undesignated fund balance $45,000 to a capital account for the purpose of purchasing electronic voting equipment. And the Finance Committee also recommends approval. I'll recognize Mrs. Driscoll for the Board of Selectmen's recommendation. So for the past three years, we've been renting these electronic devices or similar devices um, for our town meetings. Rental costs range between ten dollars and $15,000 per meeting. A more cost-effective approach is to purchase the devices now that we all have a comfort level with the fact that they work. Um, we are pursuing opportunities to enter an agreement with other towns to share this equipment, um, in which case the full $45,000 may not be spent. Thank you, Ms. Driscoll. Further discussion? Yes, Mrs. Dixon. Wendy Dixon, 295 Summer Street. I just wanted to ask, is there a warranty? And if so, how many years? Technology goes obsolete so quickly. And if it doesn't work after two years, then what? And Christine, town clerk Christina St. Pierre has done a lot, almost all of the legwork to find vendors that were less expensive than the one we were using before and to work with the vendor of this system. So I'll ask her to answer that question. Would you stand, please, Christine? Thanks. Uh, these devices have a one-year warranty. This company was actually a jump start from the company that we had le been leasing from before. That started in about 2000. They currently have these response cards that have been on the market and in use for 10 to 13 years. They're now getting more popular in college and sort of corporate training um, experiences. So they're surviving the test of the college student, including getting run over by cars and dropped from a six-story uh, building. So <laughs> it's, the technology is done with radio frequencies. It's on Radio Read, which has been around for some time. And it's basic enough for us to handle inside a closed system. We're not using the internet and Wi-Fi, which is another variable that was with the other system that we rented. So this is sort of... Um, able to bring it in-house. It's through a PowerPoint system interface, so eventually when we're in the new memorial um, auditorium space, then we'll be able to project things directly so the whole audience can see. Thank you, Christina. Further discussion? Yes, sir. John Carlson, Nine Walker Road. Uh, my question is about uh, support contract with any high-tech device you have a warranty but then you also have subsequent support contracts uh, being in the high-tech that's where most high-tech companies make their money so I wonder if that's been factored into this cost Ms. St. Pierre <clears throat> Uh, yes, there is a $1,000 annual maintenance fee and licensing fee, so that is included and is a line item, so that will be facing every year, be $1,000. Hopefully, we'll be able to join with another community. We have had representatives from other communities here tonight seeing it work, in which case we'll be able to divide that cost between us and them as well. Thank you. Further discussion? If you're in favor, please press one. Opposed, press two. And the motion prevails by 187 to 17. And now, now that we've voted, I just want to uh, express my thanks to Christina for spearheading this effort. She's done a, a fabulous job. <laughs> and Article 20 is to see what sum of money the town will vote to appropriate or transfer from available funds for the purpose of reducing the tax rate. This is, this is in here only in case 
some of the appropriations that had been recommended by the Finance Committee and the Selectmen had changed. So, Susan Beckman moves and Maury Creighton seconds to pass over, do nothing under Article 20. The Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen both recommend approval. Is the meeting ready to vote? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That's a unanimous vote. I so declare it. And Susan Beckman moves to dissolve the annual town meeting, and Eli Bowling seconds the motion. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. I declare the annual town meeting dissolved. Thank you all for coming tonight.